Right, paper two from last year, 2022. Okay. Again, I have pasted in the answers that QCAA have provided. Again, I will explain them if I think they need explaining. If it's a simple case of content knowledge, we'll go from, we'll just go over it quickly. Okay, we have some flowcharts or so pathways. The diagram shows a series of different reactions. Starting with compound A, empirical form of C4H10O. Again, it helps, it helps if you realize that that's an alcohol, right? If you see a carbon-hydrogen ratio of 1 to 2 plus 2, then it's single bonds only. If there was no oxygen, that would be an alkane. If there's an oxygen, it's an alcohol, okay? So A is an alcohol, and you will see that it oxidizes. That's an oxidizing agent. You should know that. It's one of the things you need to know. It forms D, and that's further oxidized to a carboxylic acid. So this would be an aldehyde, and A would be a primary alcohol for that to happen. All right. Now, the syllabus, uh, sorry, not the syllabus, the QCA marking guide just says alcohol. I would have personally put primary alcohol there. They're certainly not going to mind if you put the word primary in as well. I think you need to put the word primary in, but there we go. Okay. Um, compound C is an isomer of compound A. Deduce the structural formulas and names of A and C. Okay. Well, uh, A, first of all, is butan one all. Again, they have basically called it butanol. I personally think there should be a one in there. And that one is either between the N and the O, butan one all, or QCAA tend to put the one in front, one butanol. It's not as correct. It's much more correct to put the one in the actual name, butan one all, but QCAA obviously prefer it in front. Um, anyway, A is basically this... This reaction here is effectively dehydrating the alcohol. And since the OH is on the end, B is going to be but-1-ene. Okay? So you've taken away the OH off the N carbon and an H off the one next to it. But-1-ene is then basically turning back into two alcohols. Now, because it's an unsymmetrical alkene, the OH could go on the end again, and you're back to A but it could also go on the second carbon, in which case you would make butan 2 all And that, of course, is now a secondary alcohol. So compound A is butan one all um, and Put the name in there, please. I've just copied it from the marking guide. Put it in there, please. Put the structure in there and the name there. And do the same with this one. Structure there. And there we go, like 2-butanol. It should be butan 2 all But there we go. QCA, no best. All right, that should go there. 2-butanol or butan 2 all um, There's structural isomers, of course. Geometrical isomers will happen with uh, double bonds and different arrangements on either side of the double bond. But these are clearly different structures, so they're structural isomers. Uh, structural formula and UPAC name, that stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. You don't need to worry about that. Compound F. Compound F, where are we? Compound F is an ester. It comes from butan one all and ethanoic acid. So that would form butyl ethanoate. Okay. The structure is given to you. Here you see it. All right, there's your butanol bit. There's your ethanoic acid bit. When you name an ester, name the alcohol portion first, butyl, carboxylic acid portion second, ethanoate. Again, the name goes there, please. Question two, the contact process to make sulfuric acid with the vanadium oxide catalyst, Kc for the reaction at two different temperatures is shown. You will see that as the temperature increases, the Kc value decreases. Okay, therefore, when the temperature increases, the system is shifting to the left, meaning um, that's the endothermic direction. So therefore, the forward reaction will be exothermic. Okay, so increase in temperature decreases Kc. So effectively, the equilibrium is shifting in the endothermic direction, meaning the, fo the forward reaction is exothermic. 
Calculate the concentration of SO3, given the equilibrium concentrations there. So all we're doing basically is using the Kc value, 8.61 times 10 to the minus uh, 10 to the 11 equals SO3 squared. Remember the equation, square, if there's a, um, a number two in front. So that's squared. And likewise for that one, so effectively do a little bit of maths and work out the concentration. Write that concentration, please, in the box. Apply Lewis should tell you to explain whether halving the volume would affect the position of equilibrium uh, or the value of the equilibrium constant. If you halve the reaction's volume, you're effectively increasing the pressure. All right? Effectively, you're doubling the pressure. Okay, if you double the pressure, then effectively the system will oppose that and shift to the right where there's less gas, therefore reducing the pressure, opposing the effect, okay? So it shifts to the product to reduce the number of molecules, but the equilibrium constant is not changed. The only thing that can change the equilibrium constant is temperature. Nothing else can change K. Uh, 50 ml of ethanoic acid titrated with 15 of 0.1 sodium hydroxide to reach the equivalence point, pKa of ethanoic acid given. Balance equation to indicate how ethanoic acid acts as an acid. So all you're doing then is reacting this with the hydroxide ion from sodium hydroxide to form that. And it says identify the conjugate base. Well, once it loses its proton, it becomes its conjugate base. The Kb for the, the base then is worked out by effectively, uh, so what have we got? We've got the pKa of ethanoic acid is 4.76. That means its Ka would be 10 to the minus 4.76. It's the same as H plus and pH, same relationship. And then if you remember, Ka times Kb is 10 to the minus 14. So effectively a bit of rearranging and we get KB. Again, write it in the correct place, please. Uh, calculate the concentration of the conjugate base at the equivalence point. Well, effectively, at the equivalence point, the number of moles of the OH minus will be the same as the number of moles of the H plus, which is the same as the number of moles of the CH3COO minus. So doing a little bit of uh, maths. Concentration, of course, is number of moles times volume. Number of moles is, um, was it 0.1, was it? I've forgotten now. Uh, where was it? Um, 0.1, obviously, of alkali will make 0.1 of the acid. So 0.1 times 0.015. That volume there is in liters because this is in moles per liter. So effectively, the number of moles is equal to concentration times volume, which is that there. And again, write that into the box, please. The pH at the equivalence point is then worked out there. It's quite a bit of working here for four marks. So effectively, uh, what have we got? We've got Kb is equal to the OH minus times the CH3 COH over that there over the iron. Um, Kb is then given to you as, is Kb given to you above, was it? Oh, we worked it out, did we? Kb, yeah, we worked it out there, 5.75 times 10 to the minus 10. So Kb is 5.75 times 10 to the minus 10. Now, since these two are the same, we, we can change that to x squared, and the anion concentration was worked out up here uh, somewhere. Where was the anion concentration? Sorry, guys. Let's pause this for a sec. Okay, so looking at this question, this is quite a nasty question, to be honest with you, and I'll try and explain it as best I can to you. Okay, so what they've said here, first of all, is H3COH concentration is the same as OH minus concentration, that's X. What they're saying is effectively, it's a one-to-one -one ratio in the equation. So they're saying that they would both have the same concentration. Now the Kb is based on obviously those two reacting together to form that. So effectively, 
um, we are looking at the reverse of that. So a KB is for this substance here. So effectively, this has formed from those two. I, I'm sorry, it's not easy to explain this, but the bottom line is what we're seeing here is this equation in reverse. All right, so we're putting these on the top as products and this on the bottom as a reactant. Okay, now we put in their concentrations. Well, those two, of course, are the same, so that's x squared. Kb, we had cal calculated that earlier. This 2.31 times 10 to the minus 2, where the hell does that come from? Well, if you remember, we had the number of moles of the ethanoic ion was that. The volume is 50 plus 15 is 65. So this is the number of moles in 65 mil. And therefore, the number of moles per liter, you can do the calculation for yourselves, guys, is going to be 2.31 times 10 to the minus 2. So we now use this to work out X, and that gives us the hydroxide ion concentration. Then we take the negative log of that, which gives us 5.4. And then finally, we take 5.4 away from 14 to get the pH. That is a really nasty question. All right, if you have any problems with it, put a comment in the link below, and I'll do my best to explain it to you again. It's, it's a nasty question, very nasty question. Again, put the answer, please, in the box. Uh, question four, bioethanol is a renewable energy source made from biomasses such as starch and cellulose, cellulosic materials. It's a hard word to say. Two-step process for the conversion of starch and cellulose to bioethanol is shown. So the first thing we do basically is break the starch up into glucose. So we simply break all the glycosidic bonds. And then step two is where we ferment the glucose to form ethanol, bioethanol, because it's come from a bio source. Um, cellulose, if you wanted to do the same thing with cellulose, it would need probably more difficult conditions. Um, we can break down starch, as you know, we can't break down cellulose. Um, acid hydrolysis, sulfuric acid at a high temperature and a high pressure is needed to break down cellulose to glucose. It's a much harder conversion, as you can see, and that would mean it would probably be slower as well. So why is it important to control the temperature during the fermentation process? Because we're using enzymes, and enzymes are very, very sensitive to pH and temperature. All right, so yeast is very sensitive to temperature. Why is cellulose harder to convert? It's a linear polymer, whereas uh, amylose, you may know, is a sort of spiral. Now, what does it say here? Um, beta glucose monomers can pack closer together. Yeah, I think it's more about the, the fact that it forms a very, very straight chain, and that allows a lot of hydrogen bonding between chains. It's much more difficult then for any solvent to react with it, and hydrolysis is a much more difficult process. Okay, As you know, obviously, cellulose... Uh, can't be digested by, by us because we don't have the enzymes, but there are plenty of animals out there that can digest it. Cows, sheep, kangaroos, goats, they all have the enzymes which can digest cellulose, breaking the beta-glucose um, glycosidic bonds and forming these monomers. We can't recognize those monomers. Only um, the animals I mentioned can. Um, after 48 hours, there's a 15% uh, weight by volume glucose solution has produced 37.5 grams per liter of ethanol. Calculate the percentage yield of ethanol, show you working. So what have we got? The moles, um, let's have a look. Uh, um, I've just looked at the timer. I'm about to run out of time. These, these timings... Uh, maximum of 15 minutes. So I'm going to do this in the next video, a part two.